Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. We're so excited to have you all here with us this evening. We're just going to let people sign on for a couple of minutes. So while we are waiting to get started, I would love to know where you're zooming in from. We have our chat down below. If you want to type in um, where you're calling in from, that would be it's always fun to see. And we will get started in just a couple minutes. Hey, uh, I'm Teresa and Mike is here in, and we're both in Stahican. Oh and we're, Yay! We're so happy, we're so happy, so happy, so happy. To, to, to be hooked up. And Yay. we have loved every Anna Maria book. And so this is pretty cool to be in Stahican and be able to do this. But if we fall off, no problem. Thank you. Thank you for being here. And looking in the chat to Laylip's here, Kent. We got Cindy, our branch librarian from Manson's here. Hi, Cindy. Uh, East Wenatchee. Wow, that's great. So cool to see your, your hometown folk are here showing up. <laughs> okay. Looks like things are slowing down. I always have to multitask at the beginning. So um, looks like people are slowing down coming in. They'll probably keep coming, but I am gonna get the ball rolling. It's really great to have people from all across our library system joining us here tonight. Um, it's a very exciting evening for us. Um, my name is Alicia. I am the adult services manager here at NCW Libraries. And we are so thrilled to have a local Stahican based author here to talk about regional history. That just is such a cool offering for us. Um, Anna Maria um, is here tonight to talk about our latest book, Pushed, Miners, a Merchant, and Maybe a Massacre. And this program is a part of NCW Reads. This is a program that started a couple years ago. And the idea was that we wanted to really connect with our communities across our five county and 30 library locations by inviting everyone to engage with a book that sparks conversation, curiosity, and learning, because we believe that stories have the power to expand our perspective of the world, bridging our differences by highlighting how much of the human experience we all share. And I feel like this book totally does all those things. So thank you so much for being here tonight with us. You're helping us fulfill our mission to connect people of North Central Washington to vital resources and opportunities that foster individual growth and strengthen our communities. Um, we are gonna have a question and answer session at the end of the presentation. So you can um, put in your questions at any time during the presentation. Um, and then to, before I introduced Anria, I just wanna, I'm gonna put in the chat two links uh, for her website and also a reading list of books that she's written because she's written so many books, not just pushed. Um, and some other books that kind of inspired the research and curiosity journey that um, she took. All right, so now it's my pleasure to introduce Anna Maria um, Spagna. She's the author of Pushed, Miners, Merchant, and Maybe a Massacre and several previous nonfiction books that talk about nature, work, community, and civil rights, including Reclaimers, Stories of Elder Women Reclaiming Sacred Land and Water, a finalist for the Rachel Carson Book Award for the Society of Environmental Journalists, the memoir history Test Ride on the Sunny Land Bus, A Daughter's Civil Rights Journey, which was the winner of the River Teeth Literary Nonfiction Prize, A Hundred Skills You'll Need for the End of the World as We Know It, a humor-infused exploration of how to live more lightly on the planet, and three essays collections Up Lake, Potluck, and Now Go Home. Anna Maria's work has been recognized by Nautilus. Sorry, I think someone is... I'm going to mute them. Sorry about that. Anna Maria has been recognized by the Nautilus Book Awards, the Pacific Northwest Booksellers Award, and a four-time finalist for the Washington State State Book Award, which is incredible. Her essays have appeared in dozens of publications, um, 
And after working 15 years on the backcountry trail crews for the National Park Service, she turned to teaching and is currently on faculty in a low residency MFA program at Antioch University, Los Angeles and Western Colorado University. She's also served as Johnson Visiting Professor at Whitman College, the William Ketteridge Distinguished Writer in Residence at the University of Montana. And very exciting, she just took a position at Wenatchee Valley College. So she's right here in the Valley. Um, when she's not traveling to teach, Anna Maria lives in Stahican, a remote community in the North Cascades, accessible only by foot or ferry, where she and her wife, Lori, who maintains the historic Buckner Orchard, who married in 2012. We are so thrilled. So many accolades for you. Um, and we get to spend the evening with you. So I'm going to pass it over to you, Anna Maria. Thank you. Oh, my goodness. Thank you, Alicia. Um, what a thrill to be here, um, especially at an event sponsored by North Central Washington Libraries. They are a lifeblood for those of us who live in Stahican. We don't have a library branch, but um, North Central Washington, uh, they, they will send you the books. They sent me so many books that I needed for this particular project, but really all my projects um, for the last 30 years. So it's really special to be here um, with the libraries. Um, I am gonna talk, I'm gonna read some from Pushed from the new book and talk about my journey I'm going to show you some slides, visuals seem to help with this project in particular. Um, but And at the end, we'll have time for questions and answers. But I want to tell you that um, even in Zoom, I really like to be interrupted. So if you have questions or something's confusing, um, just pop a note in the chat. Alicia's going to be monitoring that, and, and she'll butt in with me, and uh, hopefully I can follow up. I'm just um, so happy that you're all here um, virtually this evening. Um, I'm going to start a little with my history. I moved to Stahican, Washington at the north end of Lake Chelan in 1990, and I had no idea what I was getting into. I took a job sight unseen with the National Park Service, so I didn't know you had to take a ferry there. I didn't know you had to go over the mountain. I didn't know anything, um, but I had some lovely friends who um, offered to drive me over the mountains uh, with their toddler, so I've got my two friends, the toddler, me, we get to Chelan or, or close to Chelan after dark and it was raining and uh, we couldn't find any place to camp. And so, um, sorry to admit that we didn't break the law. We saw an orchard that had room where we could pitch our little tent and the four of us could crowd in right next to the Columbia River. It was right under the BB Bridge, um, the BB Bridge, if you know where that is on the Arondo side of the river. Um, and the next morning I got up soaking wet and took the ferry and my life changed forever. I ended up staying in Stahican. Um, and then over the years, um, that orchard was torn out. Um, the PUD put in a lovely uh, park, the PUD Bridge Park that's there um, where you can camp. And um, for many years when we came and went from Stahican, Lori and I would camp there. So BB Bridge was super familiar to me. And one of the things that was um, that drove me into this project was that I learned that there had once been a thriving business, a store run by a merchant named Ah Chi, or um, maybe Chi Sa. And if that um, name sounds familiar to you, there is that town up in the Okanagan. It's east of Oroville. It's very, very small. It's called Chi Sa. It is named after this gentleman. And it is the only town in the entire uh, United States that is named for a Chinese immigrant, which is shocking to me. Um, even more shocking to me, um, what's the possibility that this place that BB Bridge sits may have been the site of a massacre? And so with that, I'm going to start introducing you to the story by reading a little bit from the prologue to Pushed. Uh, it tells kind of where I began and what I learned to get started. So this is from the prologue. A few years ago, while waiting for the ferry, I browsed the shelves at Riverwalk Books and picked up a paperback titled Wapato Heritage, The History of the Chelan and Intiat Indians by Tom Hackenmiller. As I reread the book, one story snagged my attention. This one wasn't exactly about the original inhabitants or not them alone. In the late 1860s, a Chinese merchant settled on the bank of, Columbia, of the Columbia River directly across from Chelan Falls, where BB Bridge Park now sits. The merchant ran a thriving business, the first of its kind along this rugged upper stretch of river, and he catered to indigenous Chinese and white people alike. But within a decade, tensions grew heated. 
one day on a high bluff within view of the store, according to lore, a group of indigenous people murdered a large number of Chinese miners, perhaps as many as 300, and pushed the bodies over a cliff into the Columbia. Locals dubbed the event the Chelan Falls Massacre. A massacre? Perhaps as many as 300 killed? Why had I never heard this story? Truth is, I'd never heard about Chinese gold miners along the Columbia, though I should have. I knew very little about Chinese people in the American West, though I've lived here my entire life. But I did know Beebe Bridge Park, a flat grassy campground constructed in the mid 90s and popular with RVers in summer. I'd often camped there on my way to or from the once a day ferry. Beebe Bridge had always seemed a nondescript in between sort of place. To think of B.B. Bridge as historically relevant felt surprising, astonishing even, a welcome challenge to assumptions I didn't know I'd held. This simple connection at first spurred me on. Over time, the story grew more complicated. Not long after beginning research, I began to hear another theory about the Chelan Falls massacre. First, as a scandalous whisper, you know what they say. Then, as a steady hum, sons and daughters of the sons and daughters of the first white settlers voiced the possibility. The attackers weren't indigenous people. They were white men dressed up to look indigenous. This possibility infuriated me. Of course, xenophobia isn't innate, but instilled a political tool and excuse. None of this was new, none of this could be substantiated, and because the facts remained so murky, I'd learned, some historians believed the massacre never occurred at all. Suddenly, a made-up massacre seemed possible, too. If a place comes to own you, does its history own you, too? I believe it does. I've read a thousand pages and driven hundreds of miles trying to figure out the truth about this forgotten massacre. I used to think of forgetting as benign, such a gentle verb to forget. Now, I am not so sure. I own land in Chelan County. I've benefited as much as anyone and more than most from the murders of non-white people. The sin of forgetting is at least partly mine. So call this a remembering, a search with no end, a river with multiple sloughs, a group of indigenous people massacred a few Chinese men, or 300 of them, or white men massacred them, or it didn't happen at all. Tributaries trickle and flood and sometimes run dry. Who believes which story and why? Why tell the story at all? Quote, Every hillside, every valley, every plain and grove has been hallowed by some happy or sad event in days long vanished. Chief Seattle famously said in 1854 in response to a proposed treaty that effectively stole a large chunk of his homeland, including the city of Seattle. Quote, even the rocks, which seem to be dumb and dead as they swelter in the sun along the silent shore, thrill with memories of stirring events, end quote. It's a perspective we either romanticize or dismiss, but rarely acknowledge as plain fact or plain lack. We've lost the sense of comfort and complicity such connection can spawn, and maybe one way to nurture understanding, to suture some semblance of wholeness, is to unbury stories of what humans did right here. So that's where I began. That's what set me off on the journey. I'm going to share my screen now and go through some slides. Can you see that okay, Alicia? Looks great. Great. Here's the cover of this book. I'm going to step back in time and talk for a minute about a previous book of mine called Test Ride on the Sunnyland Bus. Um, so this is a story of my dad's involvement in the early civil rights movement in Tallahassee, Florida. My dad died when I was 11, and he never spoke of what went on there. And so it was a really a, a journey of discovery, and it took a lot of work to find these people who rode the bus and tested an ordinance with him in 1956. But I found them. 
like I finally wrote enough blind letters that I got responses and I learned the stories of these heroes and sheroes of the civil rights movement. To meet these people, to tell these stories, to uncover that truth was so gratifying, um, such an amazing experience. And it made me so overconfident going into this project because there are no living witnesses that I can look up in the phone book and write to. There are not even any first person accounts of what happened um, in Chelan Falls. There aren't even any newspaper reports about what happened until 17 years after it supposedly happened in 1875. And I'm gonna go into all of that in a minute, but um, you know, at this point I should have been daunted, but instead I thought, well, let's see what there is. And I started where I always start, which is on the ground. Um, you all don't need this map as much as some uh, listeners do. Um, when I was back east working, I would always have to show a map of Washington State to show what I'm talking about. But, um, but of course, we have Seattle on one side, Spokane on the other. Right in the middle is Lake Chelan, and I live on the north end in Stahican. We get to the town of Chelan here, and then the very short Chelan River comes into the Columbia, and that's the supposed massacre site right there. Um, this is a view, this is an older photo looking uh, downriver from Phoebe Bridge Park. And what I started out doing was just looking for where the massacre site, where the massacre could have occurred. Um, most accounts say that it was um, a bluff 300 feet above the river within a mile of the confluence with the Chelan River. And if you look on this side of the river, there's no bluffs at all. And if you look across the river, that's a lot higher than 300 feet. And also the river is kind of far away. And, and of course the river has changed because of the dams. So I wasn't seeing um, a site that made sense. I thought about if you can see um, on the edge of the photo on the right hand side is where the Chelan River comes in. Up the Chelan River Gorge, there are several places where it could have taken place and would have been in view of the store. So that was one of my um, working theories is that that's where it happened. This is an 1880 plat that shows the store on it. Um, I find that interesting that it was a big enough business that it shows on the plat. Um, and it is Achi or Chisaw's store, but it is known in um, all of the reports or anything that you hear from that river just refers to it as the Chinese store, the Chinese store. Um, there were gardens, there was um, stables, there was all kinds of things going on. It was more like a village than just a store. Um, and here is what is supposedly a, a photo of the store, possibly a later one, I don't know. Um, this is, I got it from the Chelan Historical Society. If anyone knows where this came from, I am dying to know. Um, one rumor is that it came from the Douglas County Historical Society, but I haven't gotten a response from them. Um, you will notice that the, the construction of the buildings is distinctly Chinese. That's not just snow load making the, the ridge beam um, bend. That is, that is purposeful. And these would have been the stables for the horses up against the bluff. Um, the actual store and the gardens were closer to the Columbia River, according to, um, to most descriptions. But I find this fascinating to see just how elaborate it was at that time. Um, so, I, you know, I was learning a little bit from being on the ground, from walking around, from walking up and down the bluffs. Um, but I was going to have to go back and just learn more about uh, Chinese in the region at that time. And I was so surprised by what I learned. Um, first off, um, if we were in person, I would ask you all to guess, but to think about um, if reports from um, the late 1860s, early 1870s say that um, 800 or so white settlers lived in what we might call our region, like from the east side of the Cascades, not including Spokane, but going that direction, and not including Walla Walla, but in this whole wide swath in between, if there were 800 or so white people living here, how many Chinese you would think? were living here at that time. Um, I would have thought, I don't know, 50 or 100. I don't know what I would have guessed. But the answer is that there were twice as many. There were 1,600 Chinese estimated to be living um, here. So they were the original non-Indigenous settlers, if we want to use that word. I also thought that Chinese people came to our country to work on railroads. This is many years before the railroad. This is uh, two decades before the railroad in our, in our region. Um, so they're coming to do all kinds of things. Um, in towns like Walla Walla, especially, they're doing things like, you know, they're, they're doctors, they're merchants, they're bakers, they're tailors. Um, 
they're certainly farmers. Um, where we are on this upper stretch of river, they're miners. Um, and there's a story there too. Uh, we know about the miners who were in California, the 49ers, um, who were looking for gold. And when that kind of ran out, they started heading up for the Yukon. They heard of the gold rush in the Yukon. And many of them came up the east side of, um, of the Cascades. They came up through Walla Walla, and then they came up through Moses Cooley coming our direction. And, and we're going to cross the Columbia River. And um, they stopped and they tried panning for gold and they didn't find much. They found a little bit. They stayed for a while and they said, let's go. Let's keep going to the Yukon. Let's head on up. Um, the Chinese came after them and the Chinese found all kinds of gold. This did not please the white miners. We're starting to find a potential motive, right? Um, and one of the kind of the going reason that you'll often hear is because the Chinese are just harder workers, right? They're hard workers. Those coolies is the word used for laborers. It's a bit of a slur. Uh, the Chinese coolers were just coolies were just harder workers. Um, that's not the whole story at all. Um, as I discovered from the work of uh, Dr. Xu Lu, who's at Washington State University, and she says there are at least three other reasons why they were more successful. And one is that they mostly came from um, the Pearl Re River region in, in China, where they had been doing uh, irrigation for 10,000 years. They had technology. They knew how to move water around. Um, and one of the technological uh, tools that they brought was a rocker. This is what they're using in this picture here. Um, it's, uh, if you wanna see an actual one, there's one at the Pateros Museum, uh, right downtown in Pateros. Um, and it is a, just a contraption with uh, screens with a top level. You can put the gravel and the dirt in it and then pour water through. And then on the bottom is a, a screen with quicksilver. So what it does is it cap, uh, which is mercury, which captures the gold dust. So you're not looking for nuggets, then you're looking for the dust. And they are finding a lot of dust. So we have technology. I'm gonna show you another one of their um, tools. And this is called a long tom. To use a long tom, you get rid of the whole idea of having to pour water at all. And what you do is you divert a stream, right? You dig a ditch and divert a stream into this built, this wooden slough that's gonna um, do the same thing, have quicksilver and catch the dust. Um, but that's a lot of work to dig a ditch. There's one at the mouth of the, where the metal comes into the Columbia, it's just called the China Ditch. There's an old sign, an old interpretive sign and a wide um, what's left of the ditch. Um, but you would do all that and uh, and then bring the water down the long time, you would catch a lot of gold dust. You can't do that by yourself. So what Dr. Liu from WSU says is there's the technology and there's also the fact that they're working communally. Um, gold miners, the 49ers were famously independent. They came by themselves, they had their own grub stake or they were panning their own um, area of the river. And you'll see here in this picture, interestingly, it looks like there are Chinese miners working with white miners. They're working communally to see what they can get um, out of this particular uh, diversion. Uh, so we have those two reasons. The third reason is super fascinating to me, which is um, at the Chinese store, every time there's anything written about this Achi store, there are extensive gardens. And I guess this was quite um, uh, normal uh, and, and happened a lot. And the good thing about the gardens is that the, the Chinese workers are eating greens. They're eating vegetables. The white miners are not. They're, they're healthier. <laughs> they're healthier than the white miners are. There's also, they're also growing herbs. And so there would normally be some kind of a, a, an herbalist or a doctor who could keep the miners healthy. So I found that fascinating. The reasons why they are doing better were not just that they were harder workers, but that they had these, um, these advantages. So they're thriving, uh, they're making money, they're working different jobs, there are many of them, but life is not easy for the Chinese, even from the beginning. Uh, this is uh, an excerpt from um, a phrase book, Wong Sam's phrase book, which was rediscovered by some scholars in the 1990s. And what it would be is it's just a translation. It's just, uh, you know, you would carry it around um, to be able to, to talk to people if you only knew Chinese, you could, um, you know, uh, speak to them in English. Of course, you have to be literate in two languages to use this, which is interesting. A lot more of the miners were literate than, than we may think. Um, and this was many, many pages. Uh, um, and if you look at it closely, a lot of the phrases are sort of benign or what you would expect. Like the top one is, what goods have you for sale? 
But as you go on, they get sort of troubling, not sort of troubling, they get very troubling. Um, I cannot trust you. He took it, he took it from me by violence. He assaulted me without provocation. The house was set on fire by an incendiary. Um, it speaks to a life that is full of a lot of violence and a lot of trouble um, for people living in that time. And um, again, these aren't even the worst examples from the, the phrase book. Um, and you would have got it like at a Wells Fargo office, the Pony Express coming through. And they believe it was printed in 1875, the same year of the supposed massacre of the Chinese, uh, the Chilean Falls massacre. Um, and it's not just that it seemed to be hard. We know that violence against Chinese immigrants was ubiquitous across the West. Um, going back to at least to 1871, the Los Angeles massacre, if you've ever been downtown Los Angeles, there's Olvera Street, which is kind of where you go to the, the old Mexican part of town where you can buy tourist trinkets now. That was originally Chinatown um, until they came in and ran the Chinese off. And um, in a terrible event, they, they killed 19 of them in 1871 in the Los Angeles massacre. Um, the late 1870s, um, there was a, a famous uh, anti-immigrant um, politician named Dennis Kearney, um, who encouraged people to burn the businesses in Chinatown in San Francisco. Um, so they were trying to chase them out there. Um, in 1882, we finally get the Chinese, finally, we get the Chinese Exclusion Act that prevented all Chinese skilled and unskilled laborers from entering the country. It's the first law in the United States restricting immigration. So it's the first time we have a border patrol and um, they're working mainly in the Puget Sound. They're out in boats trying to stop uh, Chinese from coming in. And often they were Chinese who had, who had been living here, who either went back home for a visit or went up to Canada um, to do other work, but they could not come back in at that point. So now we've got border control trying to, to keep the Chinese out. Um, and if there was hope that doing so would somehow stop the violence, it only made it worse. Uh, 1885 is the most famous, um, uh -oh, uh, most famous massacre, the Rock Springs, Wyoming massacre, where at least 28 miners were killed. 1885 again in the in Tacoma, the expulsion of the in, the Chinese population, 150 to 250 people. Um, there's actually a recently I heard an opera put on that dramatized this event. So there is more attention um, coming to these um, terrible events that are part of our our communal history in the Northwest. And then interestingly, um, the Hills Canyon Massacre, which is down at the border um, of Oregon and Idaho and Washington and down in that corner in Hills Canyon, uh, a very dogged reporter for the Oregonian, Gregory Noakes, um, kept following the trail of that massacre um, and actually came upon the written confessions of five white men who were living downstream who admitted to having killed these 34 Chinese miners at the site. Um, as a result of um, Greg Noakes' work, there, um, there's now a monument there. The monument has tributes to those who were killed in English, in Chinese, and in the Nez Perce language. So um, his work really brought attention to that, brought that realization of, of what history holds. So when I'm thinking about all of this, as my journey is continuing, I'm starting to think that this story of it being white perpetrators makes a lot of sense. Um, there aren't, there are lots and lots of rumors, as I mentioned, this is the only um, written account that I can find. It's from William Lehman, Bill Lehman's wonderful book, Native River, about the history of the Columbia. If you haven't read it, please pick up a copy and read it. Um, and he quotes a settler, James Patty, who lived up McNeil Canyon, right up from uh, Phoebe Bridge, up toward the Waterville Plateau. Um, that he knew a later Chinese storekeeper named Cheyu Yu, who told him the story that it had been uh, white people dressed up as Indians who committed the massacre. Um, so I wanted to know more about this. So I wrote to Bill Lehman. Bill's a wonderful um, author and human being. And he said, you know what you need to do? You need to go to uh, the Wanapam Cultural Center, the Wanapam Heritage Center, which is um, you know down, down the Columbia, um, below I-90 there. And um, each year they have an event they call Archaeology Days. And uh, everyone should look this up. Anybody can go. It's fascinating. All kinds of topics are covered. And the Wanapalm people um, serve a meal, which is fantastic, with salmon and 
chip cherry jam and fry bread. And that's where I went um, looking for uh, Bill Lehman and just to learn what I could learn. And also especially looking for Randy Lewis, who some of you um, may be familiar with, um, a, a person who, who holds much of the history of the indigenous people in this region and has been an activist. Um, really, if anyone was going to know about this, it was going to be Randy. So I'm standing in line at the potluck getting my food when I finally run into him. I'm going to read a little, another little passage from the book. Randy Lewis is a tall man, more than a foot taller than me, quick-witted with a disconcertingly steady gaze, warm and skeptical at once. Google him and you learn he's a veteran of the American Indian rights movement of the 70s, a participant in the occupation of Alcatraz, an author and a dedicated keeper of oral tradition along the Columbia River. Meet him in person and you get straight talk. What do you know about the Chelan Falls massacre? I asked. You mean that time when the white guys dressed up like Indians? I nodded uncertainly. Do you know where it happened? Over by the springs, he said. He described a pullout where I'd walked near BB Bridge, but near BB Springs. Not a location anyone else ever mentioned, but one that made a lot of sense. The bluff is high enough and the water from the new geyser spring in the air would be worth fighting for. So it was the white guys that did it, yes, he said, no hesitance whatsoever. They always say it was Indians. A couple of Chelans were put in jail, but that's not what happened. I had never heard of anyone going to jail. He told me his great uncle as a boy overheard a group of white men bragging about the murders in a corner tavern. This would have been years after the actual event, the town grown larger. You know that tavern, Andy asked. We were holding overfull paper plates of food and holding up the line too. I do, I said. He nodded as if that sealed the deal and he walked away. So now I, I don't know what to think. Uh, I'm there at Archaeology Days, and I'm just going to learn what I can learn. I'm going to uh, go around and talk to different people. Um, I realized that an old friend of mine would have been there, Bob Mirendorf, who is the archaeologist for North Cascades National Park. I thought Bob might know something. So I chased him down in, at, at the Archaeology Days. And uh, he didn't know enough. He had done a, a, a dig for the PUD at PP Bridge, though. And he said, yeah, there were Chinese artifacts there. Um, but I'm going to pick up the story there, if you don't mind, a little bit more from this chapter. But there was something, Bob said, nodding thoughtfully. He called out to a woman I will call Vicky, standing. <coughs> I'm so sorry. Standing in the crowded lobby, an old friend of his who had worked on the BB Bridge project. He explained my interest in the massacre and asked if she remembered the dig. Yes, yes, she said. She answered breathlessly, almost nervously. In fact, it was the strangest thing. They were doing test excavation, she explained. Their heads would be down in this tiny hole, and as she was digging alone in her assigned area, she kept feeling a presence, like hearing the sounds someone makes when approaching, tools jangling, or footsteps. She'd come up and look around and not see anyone. I don't remember hearing voices, she said. Not exactly. At some point she decided enough is enough and just sat waiting. Something made me think of the Chinese. Maybe one of the landowners had mentioned them and alluded to trouble, but I certainly hadn't heard about the massacre, not back then. I heard about that much later. Did you feel spooked? I asked. Yes, she said. That is the word for it. The thing is, it felt like children. You know, the way kids write to romp, it felt like a child ran by, that brass, that brush or breeze. Children, I asked. She nodded, the conversation flagged. Her story was too chilling, too hard to process, so we retreated to easier territory. Where exactly were they? Bob believed it was closer to the store, though Vicky disagreed, and she had no patience with guessing games. She pulled up Google Earth on her phone and pointed to an alluvial fan protruding from the river north of the bridge, now covered in orchards, a place I'd never heard mentioned. It was, in fact, on the opposite side of the river from where every single existing description places the massacre, almost directly across from where Randy Lewis had said it occurred. She said she was 100% sure that's where they were. As we talked, 
Randy Lewis passed by, headed toward the patio. I reached out to touch his arm. Randy, wait, which side of the river did you say the massacre was on? Well, actually, both sides, he said, right there by the springs and also across the river. They killed the men on one side and the women and children on the other side. I was stunned. Not one account of the massacre had suggested massacres on two sides of the river. None had mentioned women and children. Randy had never met Vicki. There was no way he could have overheard our conversation in the crowded lobby. When we described Vicky's experience to him, he nodded solemnly as if to say, of course. Randy Lewis was the only one among us completely unsurprised that the truth might be radically different from any story we'd been told. So now things I thought might be getting clearer, <laughs> but they're just getting murkier. Now we have ghost stories. Now we have oral tradition. Um, I headed up the Okanagan to talk to people there closer to where Chisaw is. And I met Arnie Marchand. Arnie is a wonderful storyteller and author and elder with the Okanagan tribe, um, a member of the Colville Federated Tribes, or the uh, Federated Tribes of the Colville Reservation. He wrote a book uh, be called This Is How I Heard It, uh, which is terrific. I asked him about the uh, massacre and he said, oh yeah, and we did it. He said, we killed 700 of them there. I said, Arnie, really? And he said, yeah. He said, that's the way he heard it. Um, and he had more to say about this. Uh, Arnie took me on a drive around uh, the area of Oroville where he works at the Depot Museum and told me stories of his people. And over and over, he emphasized to me that his people have been here for 10,000 years. They have been here for a long, long time. And he kept saying, why are you so interested? and people who were here for a decade or three decades. And I just have to say that Arnie had a point, right? There's a chapter in the book that's called Forget John Wayne. And that's what he's always saying. Forget that short period of time when, when the settlers arrived, when everything was in flux. Think about the thousands of years before that. So I really wanted to honor Arnie's perspective. He also wanted to honor mine and my own interest in the project. He introduced me to Kay and Mike Sibley, uh, behind him in the photo, and also to another friend of his, he says, you got to meet my friend Dorothy. He said, Dorothy will help you. Uh, Dorothy Petrie is a volunteer with the uh, Borderlands Historical Society. She became almost a, a research partner, was a research partner with me, a dogged researcher. She knew a lot about the Chisaw area and dug up a lot of information. She said, let's go find Chisaw's grave. Who turns down that invitation? I was like, yeah, let's go find Chisaw's grave. So off we go. We got permission from the landowners, but there we are crossing the wire. Uh, there's Dorothy heading out uh, with friends. There's Mike Sibley. Uh, we get out there and Dorothy got out her crystal. She said, we're going to do some grave dousing. This was not what I expected. This is not what I thought was going to happen there. Uh, but she asked questions of the crystal, found what uh, she believes to be the grave of Chisaw and other uh, native folks up near the city of the town of Chisaw. And I said, what would you think of coming down and looking at massacre sites? Um, and we spent a day doing that. Uh, what Dorothy and her crystal found is uh, that yes, uh, many, a large number of Chinese people were killed, um, but in different locations, not all in one location. And that sort of resonates too, right? That it wouldn't have been a 300 person or a 700 person event but that violence occurred in many places. So the story is very complicated. And at this point, we have to start to consider the idea that it didn't happen at all. Um, there is one written account. Uh, it was reprinted. It was originally in the Spokane Spokesman. It was reprinted in the Chelan Falls Leader. It came out in 1892, which is not only 17 years after the event, but um, it's also a time of tremendous change in this region, in, in our place here in Chelan and Wenatchee. Um, in Chelan, uh, what they call the Allotment Act had come out where um, Native people could get paid for their property. There was a lot of pressure from white settlers to get the Native people, to get the Indigenous people to give up their land. Um, 17 civic leaders in Chelan wrote a letter to the editor of the Spokane paper essentially saying that get them out. We need them all to leave. We need to make this civilized country. 
at the same time in the city of Wenatchee, which was just being incorporated, there was a meeting of town officials who um, voted to exclude Chinese people who, as we know, had been living in the region for probably 30 years um, to not allow them to live um, in the town of Wenatchee. There was a vote and all but one of the civic leaders voted to keep them out. Noah Brown, who was a hotel owner, stood up and said that that was wrong. And you always have are happy when you're reading history and you hear of those moments of courage. But as you see here, this is the article on the right uh, or on the left of the screen is um, an op-ed about uh, keeping the Chinese out of the area. That's in the same issue of the newspaper. Um, the, uh, the description is uh, flowery. It tells a lot. It's, um, uh, it uses you know, what we would think of as slurs now for the, the redskins and the heathens and the uh, celestials. Um, it also has some sympathy for them. It's almost like that was in our sad past. It was a sad thing that happened, but it explains a couple of things. It could be kind of a twofer, right? You're um, explaining why the indigenous people are demons and why the Chinese people are now gone because they were possibly massacred. So there are reasons to think that um, it was maybe made up. Another reason is um, the lack of bones, right? Um, it, it's important to find evidence of a crime like this. And especially for uh, people of Chinese descent, bones are important. Um, there were, if you know who the six companies were, they employed a lot of miners later on, um, almost in a, a kind of indentured servitude. Um, and the six companies actually employed bone collectors who would go up and down the river collecting the bones of Chinese who died here and um, carefully, carefully um, uh, categorizing them and putting them in boxes and sending them back to their hometown um, in China. So late in my research, I finally got in hold of someone from that region of China, uh, Dr. Raymond Chong, who was interested in the project and, um, and was willing to see if anyone um, in the areas he knows, uh, had heard of this event or knew of bones that were sent back. And he said they were not. He said he thought it probably didn't happen as one huge massacre. Um, and I was willing uh, to live with that. Uh, there are actually uh, lots of examples <laughs> in the West, I turn, as it turns out, of fake massacres. This is uh, a famous one in Almo, Idaho, um, where supposedly 300 um, people on the wagon train were killed by um, Shoshone people. It has been absolutely debunked. It's been debunked for almost 100 years. There's one historian at the University of Utah who spent his whole career trying to get them to take this down. The Shoshone have asked them to take this down. They will not take it down. There is something about a massacre. A friend of mine who's a historian early in my research said, people love their massacres. I thought, what the heck is he talking about? But there's something about that, the history of violence, the way that it makes the settlers kind of the, the victims in the story, perhaps, um, is a reason to hold on to it. Because there, as just as there are made up massacres, there are twice as many massacres we hardly ever hear of, right, that did happen. And the victims in those massacres are almost always indigenous people um, or people in underrepresented, underrepresented groups. The Bear River Massacre in Idaho, Sand Creek Massacre in Colorado, the Marias Massacre, in Montana, where hundreds of indigenous people were victims. And um, so I, I'm going to end my talk here on, on that um, troubling note with a couple of questions that my research brought me to in thinking about Bush and in writing a book about a story that um, is not recorded in the way that we think of history as being recorded. Um, can telling histories of violence like massacres help justify oppression as re retaliation? Um, explain why we had to be hard on indigenous people because they perpetrated massacres and or can ignoring stories of violence like this one erase people from history right if i don't tell this story if we don't tell what happened to the miners that's that's part of what happened here like, does the history own us too it does so um those are not conclusions you'll notice <laughs> they are questions um, so with that, I'd really like to open it up to any of you. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. That was a lot in a short amount of uh, uh, time. But uh, let's see. I'm sorry. Stop. Yeah. Thank you so much, Anna Maria. I'm like, whoa, my brain is so <laughs> full. This is incredible. I just want to thank you for 
all the heart and soul that you put into this work. It's really incredible. And I feel like just listening to this, reading the book and listening to your talk, I just, I think it's such an example of how your openness really, and your curi your curiosity and openness led you to connect with so many different people. And we live in such divided times. And I think that's just such a beautiful example of how staying open can lead us to so many things. And yeah, Craig, in the the chat was saying all stories are complicated. And I'm like, I think they're complicated if you listen and ask questions, right? Um, and you don't just listen to one source. Yeah, they are they are complicated. Um, so yeah, we've got some time for some questions. I did want to say I copied, let me copy it again. I was going to put your push in the chat. Um, we do have a lot of holds because it is very popular. Everyone wants to read it for good reason. And if you haven't read it, I'm sure you want to read it now. Um, so we do have some holds, but we do have e-copies, um, Kindle copies, uh, and on Hoopla, our app, which is no holds. You can download it and read it there. So that's really exciting too. Um, I have some questions. Um, so I'm going to take advantage of that while other people are thinking about their questions. I'm like, these talks are so hard because there's so much to process. <laughs> I, really, I throw everything at you and then say, you have questions. Like, that's the worst. I'm like, worst. wait, I'm yeah. still in the beginning. Yeah, but I feel like what this is maybe more of a a process question, but like this book really started as a curiosity and I feel like curiosity can be robust and fragile. Um, and I was just wondering, you just kept going even when it stayed blurry or got fuzzier. Like, did you find a time that you really lost or questioned your curiosity? And if so, how did you stay engaged in this entire process? I think that you kind of touched on it when you talked about all the other people who had been engaged. I mean, by the time I was getting honestly frustrated <laughs> because with the lack of answers. I had already spent time with Dave and Sue Klaus and Chelan. I'd spent time with Arnie Marjan. I'd spent time, I'd been out with Dorothy Petri. I'd spoken with Dr. Chung. Like I could not uh, abandon them, right? At that point, I owed something to them for going on this journey with me. And so um, I feel like that buoyed me in a way to keep going, right? To have that camaraderie, um, it, was, it was really important to me to go at it. And I think at some point I also just had to come to terms with that if the answer was no answer, it was still an important story to tell. That's beautiful. And it totally parallels with like why the Chinese miners were so much more successful, successful is because they were um, collaborating. So I never thought of that, but that's beautiful. <laughs> Alicia. It's totally true. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, we have some popping in people that have thought about things. Um, Okay, Kim is asking, how do you go about researching events like this? Like when you hit dead ends, what do you do? Really great question. Yeah, go someplace else, do something else is what I do. I mean, I mean that in two ways. I mean, look for other avenues of information that I haven't tried before. And also go to doing a different kind of writing or a different kind of something that clears my brain. I was working on a poetry collection at the same time as doing this book. And I think that using those different parts of my brain, you know, it cleared, cleared my brain to continue on. And then also just looking for other avenues. When it find, I have to tell one quick story. When it finally occurred to me, I couldn't find this article in this Spokane spokesman. It finally occurred to me to call the newspaper and ask if they have archives. There was my answer. They said, sure, we'll send you that article. It was like two years into the project before that occurred to me. Amazing. Sorry, I put the wrong link in the chat. The new one's in there. Yeah, Great. that's so good to be like, I feel like that's with like life too, right? You headed, you headed it in or you're getting super frustrated. It's like, go change your activity, do something else. Exactly. Yes. That's really good. Um, okay, so Anne is saying, can you require this? If a place owns you, does it also own the history? I'm not quoting it correctly, but can you clarify that? And what do you think? I, uh, what I mean by that is that um, like for years I've, I've had this, what I felt like it was an intimate relationship with Stahikin and with this place. Mm -hmm. And like, I felt like this place doesn't so much belong to me as that I belong to it. Mm -hmm. And I thought of that in terms of nature and plants and landscape and the people I know and love, but I hadn't thought of it in terms of history, which is also very troubling and how much that history owns me and has allowed me to have this relationship and what do I owe to that history what do I owe uh, in going back and and to be honest that's a lot what kept me going too not just what I owed the other people 
um, who worked with me on it, but that I felt like I owed something to this place that that owns me, you know. Yeah, that, that's does really that answer beautiful. your question, Anne? <laughs> She could put in the chat. But yeah, I think that I think that makes um, so much sense. And just being of privilege, recognizing um, or starting to question, like who tells whose story, who has the right, whose stories are we saving um, and amplifying, um, which is what you were digging into. So that's really beautiful. Tom has a question for us. Um, is there a next chapter coming to this story? For example, a new archaeological dig or a push for a historical marker, new evidence coming forward as a consequence of your book coming out? That Tom, that is my greatest hope. That is my hope. Every time I give one of these talks, I hope someone in the room will say, I know someone who could follow up on that. Um, there are two, um, two archaeologists who live in Pendleton, Oregon, um, Jackie Chung and her partner, Eric, whose last name is evading me at the moment. Um, they are doing a lot of work with archaeology with the Chinese in this region, and they are interested in this area. I'm sure if they were to come upon a grant or funding or a way to work on it, they would be doing that. Ray Chong is continuing to follow up on the story um, on the Chinese end, uh, if there's anybody in China who might know something about it. But really, it is my... Um, you know, I've got those two angles. If anybody knows a different angle, this particular conversation seems useful that way because it's people in the region who might have heard something from a person who worked on one of the dams or who, someone whose, um, you know, great grandparents were here or um, indigenous folks. Yeah, that's great. Um, I know, I feel like you've just, uh, you did all this digging to kind of really like release it and now it's it has its own life um beyond the book but I did have a question about the book kind of in that terms of like we this book is so full of questions and unknowns and we love answers so much like how did you know this story like it's the work is still rever reverberating from your work but when did you know when to release the book like when to be done with the book such so so important that you say that because I mean there's a little part of you that just wants to keep hanging on and wait until there's an answer don't put this out there till there's an answer but I was writing this book during the pandemic and um okay. and the kind of xenophobia that we started seeing arise and particularly as it was targeted at Asian Americans it seemed like this was no longer just a book about the past it was also a book about um the way we behave um, in our culture, and that perhaps this per this particular cultural moment is a time to bring the story forward, and again, make it a communal project, see what else we can find out, see how we can live with the uncertainty of our mm -hmm. past as well, but it was definitely the political moment that drove me to think, no, nope, now is the time, yeah. Yeah, and did you already mention how, like, how much time did you, you spend researching on all these trips and these journeys? How much time was that? It was about five years total. So, wow. Yeah, yeah, it was a long time of, and I would always think, no, as soon as I get to those archives at Whitman, I will have the answer. As soon as I get up to the Spokane Public Library with its Northwest archive, I will find the answer. And then uh, Dorothy Petrie even had, she had these journals of an old county commissioner who knew she, she saw. And for the first time in my writing career, I hired a student to read through all of them and find the answer. There weren't answers. Not yet, not yet. That's incredible. So yeah, I'm like, now I'm imagining it must have been really hard to release because you, I mean, five years is a huge investment. So that's really incredible. Um, Anne was mentioning in the chat that she's familiar, she's familiar like with history in other locations, Arizona and the, the Southwest too. Um, I'm sure there's so many, so many stories. Up here in the Northwest, which is where I've spent my whole adult life, but I grew up in Riverside. Mm -hmm. California, um, east of Los Angeles, and it was only by doing this doing this project that I discovered there had been a Chinatown in Riverside that had been destroyed in the way that so many were. So you're right, Anne, it's all over the West um, that this occurred. Um, here's a specific question from Tom. Um, if we're inspired by reading this book to go to the scene where the massacre might have happened, how much beside the BB Bridge Park is public land? I'm not sure if well, you know um, that. 
the, the store was entirely on what exists as BB Bridge Park. So you can walk everywhere okay. where, the, where the store was. If you're looking for the massacre site, the other interesting place to go is across the river to the BB Springs area, which I believe is run by um, Fish and Wildlife or the State Wildlife. Um, but there's a trail up there. And right there along those trails, right off the road between Chelan Falls and Chelan is where uh, Randy Lewis was suggesting that the massacre site may have been. So it's an interesting place to look. There's also a dirt road, the old highway, the old stagecoach road that goes from uh, Chelan to Chelan Falls. And there's some very interesting sites there that very well could have been massacre sites. That's actually, if I were to choose one, that's where I think it probably happened. So really interesting places that are public that you can um, check out. There'll be a huge uptick of visitors at the BB yeah. Bridge Park. They're like, what's going on? <laughs> Okay, Craig has a question. I was struck by the costuming of the of the white vigilantes with with the much cherished Boston Tea Party crew as well as the January sixth shaman headgear. Did you come across any other costume vigilantes events during your research? I absolutely did, and and I'm not going to remember the exact dates or places, but it was not uncommon. And there and historians have different um, theories. So they would use uh, often like shoe polish or um, um, walnut husks to darken their skin um, and then dress up. And, um, uh, you know, on one hand, it's um, affixing blame to the um, indigenous people, but there's also a theory that it was making themselves tough, like they're savages, like they're wild, which kind of has parallels, right, to the January 6th people. It wasn't like they were trying to blame anybody else. They were just trying to be wild or native in that, in that unkind connotation or in that different connotation. But it's a, it is a long history. I think that um, some of the events in Utah with, um, with uh, violence between um, the settlers coming there and indigenous people, there was some of that dressing up went on down there. Um, but yeah, not uncommon and so fascinating. Yeah, very fascinating. Um, we have a few more minutes if there's any last questions that people want to put in. Um, I was curious on like your writing process because in your book, I, I, what I love about your writing is there's conversations that just really pulls you in to feel like you are right there in the moment. And so I'm wondering what is your like note taking or journaling process look like when, when you're in it? Well, um, in some situations, like when I was out dousing with Dorothy, um, she um, generously allowed me to record. So I had a digital recorder with me and could record because it's really important in those situations and with Arnie Marchand as well. Um, in other cases, um, I use what, what I've come to think of as the Comey method. Remember uh, during when James Comey was having meetings with Trump and then he would leave and he'd go out and he'd write down everything that happened as fast as he could. Um, so sometimes that's what I would be doing. I'll go and have an experience I'm not expecting to have and then I'll leave and I'll write down absolutely everything. And um, honestly, I'll do that even when I record a conversation because there are some things that are happening that won't come through in audio, right? The visuals or the, or the dynamics or what I was thinking about. And so almost any time I'm out doing research, I'll just go back and write down as fast as I can everything I can possibly remember. And then, you know, maybe a, a small portion of that appears in a book, but it can sure be helpful. Yeah, that's yeah. great. Yeah. Um, okay. I am going to ask the, I think I'm, I get the last question. Alicia, you're great. Ask away. <laughs> okay. I want to know, I mean, it sounds like your brain is still very much with this project, but what's your current curiosity? If you have time amongst all your teaching gigs, I mean, you're busy. <laughs> yeah. I've been, I've been having a lot of fun um, teaching a course called uh, writing the non-human. So writing um, animal perspectives or thinking about animal perspectives. And so um I'm not quite sure if I'm ready to take that leap, but I'm trying and I'm edging toward it. I find it so fascinating because, um, you know, we have relationships with the non-human world, right? And we know that they have feelings and they're sentient. There's all this information, like the Ed Young's book, An Immense World is another one I'd recommend. Um, yeah, what do we do? How do we change our way of having a relationship with that those kin? So I think that might be the next the next direction. But um, Alicia, I can't thank you enough. This was so much fun to spend time with you and with everyone oh, here. Thank you. Yeah, we thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank yous are coming in in the chat. Uh, we're, we're right there at time. So um, 
we just want to thank you for this labor of love that you've put into this work. I feel like you're just expanding the awareness and consciousness of people in this region about a really important history that's been silenced. So thank you for that. Yeah, so many thank yous. People loved it. So thank you everyone for joining us. Oh, I wanted to give one more little shout out. Anna Maria, you're incredible. Thank you for having us. If you all are living in the Wenatchee Valley area, she will be joining us tomorrow night at Wenatchee Public Library at 430. And it's going to be a conversation with Chris Rader, who's a local history extraordinaire. So that's going to be really fun. Same topic, but just a different um, approach to the conversation. So I think if you're in the area, you would love this conversation. Um, we're really looking forward to that. And then if you're not in the Wenatchee area, but you love our virtual programs, I'm going to copy this in the chat really quick. We're um, going to have a program about the best hikes in North Central Washington with the Washington Trails Association next Thursday at 6 p.m. There's a link right there for you to register. It's going to be really fun and informative. Um, so I'll leave you all with that. And Rhea, I will see you tomorrow night in Wenatchee. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. And have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Bye.